Some facts are like the grammar of a language, and some are like words. The grammar gives a structure, helps us to interpret the words, puts the words in order, focuses on which words are important, which ones are not, what they mean. And then the words fit into the structure. When the Buddha taught the Four Noble Truths, it was like he was teaching the grammar for the practice. They're not just four interesting facts that you file away in your vast collection of knowledge of facts. They're meant to structure everything you think about. He's pointing out that the problem of suffering is the big problem in life, and here he's got the solution. And if you want to solve the problem, you have to be very careful about what you focus on and what you don't. You see this in his teaching on questions. Some questions are meant to be answered in a categorical way. In other words, the answer is true across the board. Some are answered in an analytical way, say it depends on the situation. Some are answered with cross-questioning. The Buddha would question his listeners and make sure that they would understand the general framework of what he was going to say. And then some questions just simply put aside. And there's some pretty big ones, questions that people were fascinated with a lot of the philosophy at the time. And the reason they put them aside was because they got in the way of solving the big problem. And the same principle applies to the facts that we see around us. We're sitting in this room. There are lots of things you could be thinking about, about this room, what's going on in this room right now. You could decide that you wanted to count all the atoms in the air, or make a catalog of what books we have over on the shelves, what boot images we have on the altar. It would be a waste of time, especially if you think that your purpose is to put an end to suffering. You want to focus on your own mind. You want to focus on your own body as you feel it from within, to get the mind to settle down. So you're selective in what you focus on, and also what you say about it. You could be commenting on how your mind is not settling down and how you're a miserable meditator. Or you could be commenting on how at this time you were able to stick with five breaths, next time let's try for ten, or try it fifteen. In other words, you could talk to yourself in a discouraging way or an encouraging way. It's up to you. The question is, what purpose is served? This truth, and it may be true that you're not doing well in the meditation, but what is it for? What does it help? This principle applies throughout the practice. When you're Practicing the precepts, following the precepts. You can focus on the things that you're missing out on because you can't lie or can't steal, can't kill, can't have illicit sex, can't have intoxicants. Or you could focus on how much better your life is because you're not doing any of those things. Same with the concentration. You focus on the breath. You talk to yourself about how the breath can be comfortable here, it can be comfortable there. There may be parts of the body that are in pain where you don't have to focus on them. You focus on the parts that you can make comfortable. Get them on your side. Now, once you have them on your side, then you can deal with the parts that are not so comfortable. In some cases, you can actually make the pains go away. other cases, the pains don't go away. At least you're not tensing up around them, making them worse. As you spread the comfortable breath energy through those different parts of the body. And then when the time comes to analyze the pain, you realize you've got a good place to go. In case you're not getting anywhere with the analysis. So you're learning to focus on things selectively. The same with discernment. As the Buddha said, you could focus on how pleasant feelings can be and pleasant 
perceptions can be and how much fun it is to th engage in thought fabrication. And as you said, these things do have their pleasures, but that just gives rise to more passion, aversion, delusion. Or I could focus on their, their drawbacks, and no matter how well you fashion, fashion them, they're still going to have their drawbacks. There's still parts of them that you can't rely on, parts of them that will be stressful, parts of them that you cannot control. And so you have to ask yourself, why are you engaging in thoughts about them? If you're engaging in thoughts about them for the sake of putting them to suffering, okay, you focus on the drawbacks at the right time. When you're trying to get the mind in, into concentration, you focus on the ways in which you can get them to, at least some extent, under your control, can get them to be constant, can get them to be easeful. So you have to learn how to select your truths, even as you're going through the day. The same principle applies. You're dealing with other people, you could focus on picking up ways in which they show disrespect to you, or you decide that that's not important. After all, there have been times when you've had disrespect for them. It's only natural to have it for you. If you think in those terms, it's a lot easier to let the issue go. You have to remember that all perceptions give only a sketch of reality. Every way in which you represent the truth to yourself has its false side. You have to simplify things for your purposes. That's what they call the pragmatic approach to truth. You focus on truths that serve a purpose. If they don't serve a purpose, then no matter how wonderful they are, why bother? If they do serve a purpose, and even though it may be stressful to think about certain issues, because they require that you think and work, but have put forth an effort, but if they serve a purpose, it's worth it. This is why the concept of atta, A-T-T-H-A, -T plays such a large role in the Buddhist teachings. It's the purpose of his teaching, the meaning, the goal. If you keep the goal clearly in mind, then it helps you to sort out which facts you want to focus on, which ones are worth focusing on, and once you've got them selected, what are you going to think about them? How are you going to interpret them? What meaning are you going to give them? For what purpose? So don't let yourself get waylaid by things that are irrelevant. Because as you go through life, there are a lot of issues that you're simply going to have to put aside, because they get in the way of the things that are really important. Even as you're dying, you could focus on the fact that you're going to be missing this, missing that, and the mind starts thrashing around. You could focus on the fact that well, now the body's going to be falling apart. Where are you going to focus your attention? so that you don't create unnecessary suffering for yourself. So here again, the Four Noble Truths provide the grammar, they provide the structure for how you can structure your sense of what's important, what's not important, where your priorities are. And then anything that fits into that grammar, okay, it's part of the language of the practice. Anything that doesn't fit into that grammar, you can put it aside. No matter how much you've been attached to it, no matter how large a role it has played in your life so far, you have to learn how to take it apart. In line with the Buddhist grammar. So you can see what aspects of what you've learned from your life are actually going to be helpful in the path and which ones are not. It's not like you throw everything away 
or you deny the importance of your past experience. Simply that you learn how to convert it to a new use. Memories of the past that made you miserable, you can take them apart. Where is the perception? Where is the fabrication? Where is the allure? Why do you go for them? What gets accomplished by them? And what are the drawbacks? As you take these things apart, you begin to see, you can get a new perspective. You can think in terms of the principle of karma. That there's this huge back and forth that's been going on for who knows how long. And then the desire to get something brought to closure or get something resolved starts to seem meaningless. And that's when you've used that particular story, that particular narrative, for the sake of the drama. When you develop that sense of sangwega. So think about the Buddha's grammar and how all the different things you're focusing on either fit or don't fit into that grammar. It's like any language. It's very good for expressing some things and not so good for expressing others. But this one is good for expressing the truths that lead to the end of suffering. <coughs> There's no better language for it than that. So take everything else and reject what doesn't fit into this grammar, take on what does fit. And you find that it really does serve a purpose, that you'll be glad that you took on. And that's for the things you've had to let go of. You'll be glad that you were able to let them go.